Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good to have you back for another uh, James Bible study. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 1 to 13 in this video. And so let's go ahead and jump right into the text. Begins, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, You stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said... Do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay. So, there are a couple of... Um, couple of ways to break this text down. The first thing is the idea of showing no partiality. Um, as you, well, let's start with the first thing that's of note. The first thing of note, um, that's not necessarily the whole theme, is this phrase right here. Um, Hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Here, I know it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to modern contemporary ears such as ours and people who've been Christian for a long time. Um, that calling Jesus Lord and Christ and using the phrase Lord of glory is very significant. One, because this is only the second time, I think this is only one of two times where James specifically mentions Jesus. And when he does, he is equating Jesus with the Lord of glory, which is an Old Testament phrase for God. So in this letter, in this epistle, James, the brother of Jesus, is giving Jesus the title Lord and Christ, and then also Lord of glory, therefore naming him both God and Messiah. So these are these are big deal ideas. These are these are world changing ideas for the Jewish Christian. Um, this is what gets them persecuted by the locals in Jerusalem is that they're confessing Jesus to not only be the Messiah but also to be God Himself. Um, so that's that's just sort of a it's not the main topic of the text. It's just revealing about who James is and what he believes about Jesus, as we also believe. The main theme of the text is showing no partiality. And then he gives an example. Now, we don't know if this is a specific example or a general example. Uh, but we have, so we have four, if, so the four there is going to explain the instruction of showing no partiality. So now he's going to explain this, this rule. Because again, we've shifted now, and I, I've been saying that in each of the chapter one videos, that chapter one serves in, as an introduction. We're now past chapter one, and so now we're getting to some of the meat. But it also means that we're, getting, we're gonna hear the same themes come up again. But he's gonna add more detail to it. So here we're showing no partiality. Why? Or how, explain that. And so this is what verse two is doing with the four. Comes in, man coming in with nice stuff, poor man coming in shabby clothes, pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing, and you say, sit here in a good place, while the other one says, stand over there, sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves? 
So have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is the reason. So this right here. Why are we not showing partiality? Because you're making distinctions among yourselves and you're judging with evil thoughts. How so? Well, you have judged as the world judges. Now remember in the last video we were talking about keeping oneself unstained from the world, how we as a people of God have to live as people of God. And so when we do that, we have to... Um, our thoughts also have to be transformed. And James is saying, look, you're, you're doing things as the world does. Um, you're, you're, looking, you're looking at mere appearances and you're not looking at faith. You're not looking at the heart of, of the people in your company. Now, one of the other things um, to, to just note here for a moment is your assembly. Now, we don't know if... We don't know what James has in mind exactly. There are two options. There is a, a legal assembly and a religious assembly. Now, when I preached this text on Sunday, I went with the religious assembly. I think that's what it is. I think that's what James is talking about. But there is room for disagreement on whether or not the assembly is a legal assembly, as in someone has brought um, well, not even illegal. It's a spirit. It's sort of like a congregational dispute resolution assembly. So there are, in the ancient world, especially in these smaller communities like Jewish Christians in, that are spread about, um, if they had a dispute between parties within the community of believers they would attempt to reconcile that dispute amongst themselves. And so maybe the pastor or one of the elders would sort of mediate the dispute. And so in this assembly, they are prejudging the poor people over the wealthy people. Now we see that in the world in sort of records of the ancient world in that when it comes to civil uh, civil dispute processes that the rich would often pay the judges or the mediators, uh, whoever was going to sort of deal with the civil dispute, just pay them off and then they get the judgment in their favor. And then that would throw the poor person uh, into jail or into prison or into work camps or you know whatever it might be to pay off whatever wrongdoing that was done. And so because of that system of, of civil dispute resolution, if there was a dispute among the community, you would not go before a judge if you didn't have to. You wouldn't go before a Roman authority. You would try and get it settled within, sort of in-house. And if the assembly that is trying to make this distinction is acting like the civil realm, the Roman realm, then it's not doing its job. And it's not acting as the Christian community would. So that is... A possibility in understanding this text and sort of the context that's surrounding this instruction that in Christian dispute and how we deal with brothers, um, in we're going to use this sort of assembly picture. It doesn't really change the meaning um, when you think about what is the the moral rule that James is expressing. What is he trying to convince the people to do? It's just when you picture the situation. Are you picturing voters meeting or worship service, right? So that's sort of the distinction there. Christians are gathering together. They're sorting out disputes. Is it more voters meeting administration, civil sort of stuff? Or is it religious gathering, ritual gathering, the Lord's Supper sort of playing a role, you know, hearing the word proclaimed? Are we doing, is it that setting? Both settings don't convey the same sort of import uh, of meaning here. Um, they're, either way, they're making distinctions and they're judging incorrectly. So one could take, if you look at the text here then, uh, if you take this first part, you have then made distinctions among yourselves. The distinction among yourselves, oh, uh, that's sort of like in the assembly, you've put the rich in this good seat and you've put the poor on the floor 
or made them stand, um, but it doesn't quite fit with the judging, unless, of course, you think judging between one and the other in terms of status. If you do the assembly, or the like the voters' assembly, then the judging with evil thoughts makes sense, um, but the distinctions among yourselves it doesn't quite fit as well. And so both of those phrases sort of go with either or, and because James isn't specific, you actually could go with either and, and not get yourself in trouble. Because again, the point remains either way. It's just the context of what you think the is being addressed. So then in verse 5, it, goes, it says, Listen, my beloved brothers, um, God has not chosen, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Uh, and this, the way this is phrased, the way it's asked in the Greek, the, James is expecting a yes, God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith, um, which he has promised to those who love him. So again, so one of the ni- important things here to note is it's not that God has chosen all the poor in the world. Okay. So just because you're poor doesn't mean you get into heaven, and just because you're rich doesn't mean you get kicked out. Uh, God has, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which has, which he has promised to those who love him. So those who love him are promised the kingdom. Um, That's who's being promised the kingdom. And those who are poor who love him are then rich in faith. Now, why are they rich in faith? Well, this is a concept that I think we kind of understand fairly well, um, and it's fairly straightforward, because if anyone has ever struggled in life, they will understand that in those struggles, your faith is tested. And so I think I've talked about testing. Well, it came up in chapter one, of course. Um, But when we think about testing and being tested, in that testing, Our faith is being tested, and when you are poor, you inevitably have more trials. Your life is harder, and because it's harder, you then have to rely more on God. And therefore, the poor, the needy, the afflicted, have had their faith tested all the more, and if they remain faithful, are much stronger in their faith than one who hasn't been tested. It's the difference between somebody who exercises once a month and someone who exercises every day. You would assume, and you're probably right, that the person who exercises every day is stronger than the one who exercises once a month. Obviously, there are exceptions to that rule, but in general, in comparison, one would assume that you'd be stronger. Therefore, If you are poor and being tested every day and requiring God to provide daily bread for you that you don't know where the next food's going to come from, that's a daily test of faith in God. The rich don't necessarily have that test of faith every day. They have other trials. They have other temptations. They have other issues and afflictions, but they may not occur on a daily basis. And therefore, because they can solve many of their problems through their wealth, their status, their power, their faith is not as easily tested, and therefore it does not also easily grow, and therefore they don't become rich in faith. So, not that it's impossible, because it comes back to those who love him. That's the key thought here, um, as those who are heirs of the kingdom, uh, which God has promised to those who love him. So, that's what gets you in, right? So, um, Then uh, we have verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. In other words, by your judgment with evil thoughts and by your distinctions, you've dishonored the poor man. You've ignored this general truth, probably because they didn't understand testing, which he's already alluded to. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? The ones who drag you into court? Again, that court language. Um, Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? referring to the word Christians. So here, James gives three points in which the rich oppress the poor and the rich oppress the Christian. So they are, the Christians are oppressed, they're dragged into civil court, 
which means they're not being it's not being handled on a, on a, a religious dispute side right so this is a this is a civil court not an assembly of believers um, and they're blaspheming the honorable name so we're in another distinction here about setting in chapter two are the rich that are being discussed in this text believers or unbelievers how you answer that question determines how you feel about the rich so it is my thought with this text that the rich here are unbelievers and i say that because they're blaspheming um and so if they're blaspheming the name christian then they're not believers however it could have been a past idea that they had been blaspheming and yet they're still treated as if they weren't so I think it's still unbelievers, but if you treat them as believers, then you've got to kind of wrestle with that blaspheming idea, and you have to change the verb tense into more past-oriented than present-oriented, and that they're taking them to court instead of the community assembly of dispute resolution, sort of the Christian way of dealing with that kind of like Matthew 18, though Matthew hasn't been written yet, that sort of dispute resolution amongst brothers in, in the faith. So... It's not clear in the text which one it is, but I think the better way to interpret the text is that they're unbelievers, and it's because these things are happening to Christians in general, whether they have money or not, because they are foreigners to their towns that they're in. And not necessarily foreigner, as in, like, in the same sense that I'm a foreigner to Hammond, or I, you know, I was a foreigner in southwest Kansas. Um, if you've ever moved into a small town or been in a small town or a small community, your presence is recognized as other if you're not born and raised there, if you don't have family connections there. Um, I spent six years in Kansas, and I was never a Kansan in the eyes of those that live there. I, I was, in a sense, a foreigner. I didn't understand the way southwest Kansas worked, for example, or because I wasn't born and raised there, didn't have family ties there. I'm always an outsider, which, you know, is fine. Pastors sort of play that role all the time. We get sent all over the place. I don't want to preach in my hometown with my people that know me because it doesn't go well. Um, ministry to your own people. Uh, Jesus, for example, you know, they try and throw him off a cliff. Uh, Bremen's pretty flat, so I'm not too worried about being thrown off a cliff there. Um, the highest point is like a hill in a soccer field. It, it'll be fine. Um, so I forgot where I was going with all that. Um, uh, oh yeah, outsiders. Um, and so because the Christians are, um, fleeing persecution from in Jerusalem, they have now moved into communities in which they are outsiders. And if you're an outsider, you're easier to oppress because there's no one on your side. So if local politicians, if local uh, rich people, if local rich people want to oppress you and cause injustice upon you and uh, cause you harm in the community, it's easier to do because you don't have any history. No one knows who you are. You are an outsider, and therefore you are a threat to the community and to the status quo. And so the rich will oppress them, and then they'll drag them into court to further that oppression and to push them out of the community. And then they're going to blaspheme the, them, their presence. They don't want them there because they're shifting the community dynamics. Um, and so the people who are behind their life being difficult as Christians in their new communities are the rich. And then when they come in and visit their assembly, they treat them like they're, like they're heroes. While those who are like them in their oppression and their injustice, the poor, are treated shamefully. And so James is pointing out this, this nonsensical problem and this nonsensical issue uh, in the church that this community is being oppressed by these people, made fun of by these people, their lives are made more difficult by these people, and yet when they walk in the door, they're given the seat of honor, while those who are with them, who struggle with them, who, want, who have heard the gospel and want to be part of the assembly— are put on the floor. So 
this is this is James's like, hey, stop it. Look at what you're doing. Understand what you're doing. Uh, it's not. You're still thinking like the world. You're still thinking that these these wealthy people who have been oppressing you are going to all of a sudden be helpful. And that's not going to be, whether that's the case or not, you shouldn't treat them as if they are greater than those who have, who have who are rich in faith. So then back to the text. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and convicted by the law as transgressors. Okay. So this section... Um, of 8 to 13 is still the same idea, but it shifts a little bit in what it's trying to say. So if you really fulfill the royal law, and I made um, kind of the heart of my sermon on Sunday kind of focused in on this idea of royal law and what makes the law royal, and that is its source, that Christ is king and Christ has given us the law, therefore it is a royal law in a royal kingdom, and that kingdom is God's people, which is sort of piggybacking on to the end of chapter one uh, in that video uh, as well, in that the royal law and the perfect law and the law of liberty all sort of have this same idea of being having their source from Christ and in his um, giving of himself and his uh, bestowing upon us this citizenship into his kingdom, uh, we are then freed from the world, uh, which is what causes us to be under a law of liberty. Um, and the royal law is that its source is in Christ the King. Now, he then cites from Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Leviticus 19 has, uh, I think he cites it twice in this these first eight verses. So this is one citation up here. But then the topic of, I think, 19... Five. Um, that is some terrible writing. Um, but in Leviticus 19.5, I think he uh, Moses writes about treatment of the poor. And then in 19.8, I think it's 19 verse 8, it's this one, uh, you shall love the labor as yourself. Uh, so this royal law, according to the scripture, um, is Leviticus. So you always think, oh, we don't have to read Leviticus. And yet, here's James citing it as the royal law um, because it reflects Christ's command. Um, this, this works well for highlighting and marking, but my handwriting is just awful with it. Um, but that's okay. I knew that already. So if you show partial, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So we get convicted when we show partiality. Um, why? Because we're sinners. So sin, convicted, transgressors, these are all sort of connected ideas. Um, and then whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, this is, we recognize this as true, that if you break the one, like I do this when I teach the Ten Commandments to the Compromands, if you break one of the Ten Commandments, you're probably breaking almost all of them. Um, you know, if take for example, if you've murdered someone, not that anybody's out there murdering people, uh, you've likely dishonored your parents, so you've broken the Fourth Commandment. You've obviously dishonored God. You've made yourself the ruler over all things of life and death, so therefore you've broken the First Commandment which shows that you've misused the name of the Lord your God. You've disgraced his name by calling yourself a Christian who then murders. You've not kept the Sabbath day, not because you haven't rested, but because if you had been hearing the word and doing it, you wouldn't have murdered. You've likely taken the person away from someone else, which is the heart of adultery that you've stolen them from another. Thus, you've also broken the commandment to not steal. Uh, you've then... Uh, murder them for a, you have a motive and it's likely coveting you've you're trying to get something out of this action and so uh, then you probably lied about it so in one sin you've kind of broken all of them and that's a, you know an extreme example but we can take it to a smaller degree when we start dealing with thoughts and words you know you lied to someone well you can go through the same progression 
lying dishonors your parents, it dishonors God, it shows that you don't hold him as holy or as king, and so you're misusing and misrepresenting him. You're not listening to his word that you hear on your day of rest. Um, you have not seen the, the person you've lied to as a person, therefore you've killed them in your thoughts because they're not worthy of the truth. Um, you've lied for some purpose, some um, so, some sort of evil desire, which would is likely coveting. You want something out of this lie um, that the truth would not give you. So again, you've kind of gone through the whole Ten Commandments by breaking just one. So we kind of understand that point um, when we reflect on the Ten Commandments and reflect the ripples of our of one sin. It ripples out. It's not just. It's never just. Oh, I lied, and there was nothing else behind it. There's a great deal behind every sin. There's a great deal behind all of our actions. Um, there's motivations and there's thoughts and there's, there's all sorts of things and there's ethics behind it all. Um, so we get that, what he says, that whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. Um, and that's also, it comes back to this point, uh, looking at the text here. Um, it comes back to the royal law idea that all the law comes from the one single source. Um, for he who said, right? So that's it, right here in verse 11. For he who said, the one who said don't commit adultery also said don't murder. And because he said it, uh, it is the law because he's the king. Um, and so if you break the law at any point, it shows a, a lack of a commitment, a lack of allegiance to the one who has written it. Uh, and so you become a transgressor of the law. So uh, I think I made this point in the sermon too. Um, and it, it's sort of the main thrust here that if we rebel in even the small things that God has given to us, uh, it shows a larger issue at heart of our rebellion against God as king and as God as the royal lawgiver. That if we think he's wrong in this thing, we can't say he's right in everything else because it all ties together. And I made this, I made the distinction in, so I used the example of, you know, not registering my dogs at city hall doesn't, necessarily negate the vision of the Hammond mayor. Like it does a little bit, um, but like if he's got a vision for downtown, which he does, and he's the whole plan, it's the whole thing. Um, and if you're a business in downtown and you sort of do the opposite of everything that he's trying to build, you know, that will show your rebellion against his vision. And that's one person, you know, there's lots of people involved in our local governments and, and state governments and whatnot. And so it's difficult to say, oh, if I do this, I'm against this person or this or this entity, right? So if I don't mow my lawn, it's not like I'm against the federal government, even though, you know, in all the layers, it sort of does affect, like, it doesn't do any good if, you know, to be against the president and then not mow your lawn and then get a city citation, right? So... It, that metaphor somewhat breaks down to a degree, but I think we understand the concept sort of zoomed out in that once, if, if I guess I could use a different example. If your mother gives you a laundry list of things to do, you know, you got a list of 10 things and you decided you were only going to do three of them, does that show respect to your mother? No, you didn't do the things she asked you to do. Even if you did a partial list, she's still going to come home and be angry because the seven things weren't done. So if, therefore, you have disrespected, you've, you're showing that you don't have a great love for your mother because, you know, she asked you to do these things. You had time, you had the ability, power to do so, and you didn't. What does that say about you? What does that reflect about you? So that's the same sort of concept as what James is getting at here is that You've been given the law, you've been given the instruction, therefore act on it, act as you do. And so it says, that's so why as he continues then in, in 12, so speak and so act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty, um, for judgment is coming. So you're, you're sort of already looking towards that judgment idea um, that you're going to be judged and you're going to be judged based on whether or not you followed the law. If you, you know, wanted to be, um, if you wanted to be, part of God's kingdom, then you would do these things. And so you'd speak this way and act this way um, so that when you are judged, you would be judged um, as one who wants to be part of the kingdom. 
So then we get to 13, and I, I think this is, in a sense, it's not necessarily the heart, but it's where we find the gospel at. Uh, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It sort of feels like it's out of place when he says it, um, if you're not following along with the whole argument. So judgment is without mercy to one to the one who has shown no mercy. In other words, why would you show mercy? This is sort of the point I was getting at in the very start of this video. Our good works reflect, actually, I think I started to talk about this in the first video, or the last video, the last chapter one video. I talked a little bit about this. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know, it's been, it's already been 20 minutes. I already forgot what I said. Um, so let's just look at it as it is here. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Well, who, what kind of person shows no mercy? Someone of the world. So if you are acting as someone who shows partiality and judgment with evil thoughts and you're making distinctions based on social power and status and you're making judgments based on you know, bribes and uh, civic advantage, then there's going to be no mercy shown to you because you're not a person of God. You're not operating as a person of God. If you were operating as a person of God, you would find mercy throughout your life giving mercy to others. And so mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, I was trying to stop it. Um, and so if mercy triumphs over judgment, then we are given mercy as we show mercy. Now, that's important to un sort of unpack a little bit. One, because we say it all the time in the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others, trespasses. So we in our Lord's Prayer sort of make the connection between our the forgiveness we receive and the forgiveness that we give. James is taking this approach in the concept of mercy and not in forgiveness, but I think mercy encompasses forgiveness as well. We have been shown mercy from the cross. We have been shown mercy from God through Christ. That mercy is given to us. We have received it. We are heirs of the kingdom, as it said earlier in the text. Um, yeah, so heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. Why would we love him? Because he's shown us mercy. He's shown us his mercy through the cross, through Christ, through his death and resurrection. These are the ways in which we know mercy. And so then mercy, that mercy will triumph over judgment. Um, and so we need to focus then on this idea of, uh, of mercy triumphing. Um, and so then we then reflect that mercy uh, because we've been given that mercy. So we show it to others as the people of God. That's our job. That's our responsibility as, as his people. So that's what this text is getting after here, that judgment without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, you're going to be judged based on your works of mercy you know, why is that? Well, because works of mercy reflect the one who has given you mercy, who has brought you into the kingdom, who has brought you uh, into to the relationship with the Father. And so therefore, um, if you reflect it, you've shown that you're doing it. Going back to that doers and hearers dynamic uh, from the previous section. Okay, so that's 2, 1, 2, 13. Um, uh, next section will be all about faith and works in uh, 2 14 to the end of whatever chapter 2 is, which is the midweek sermon text, which um, I haven't got to yet. So that's the part one of chapter 2, and I will see you next time for the rest of chapter 2. Have a good rest of your week.